Um, so yeah, this is the second Aircraft Professionals Technical Network workshop. We had one in Dublin a few weeks back, and I got some feedback that uh, people would be interested in doing a workshop or a seminar on uh, aircraft digital records, uh, Spec 2500, uh, paperwork traceability. So um, uh, when I inquired, uh, there was a couple of people that were kind enough to, to uh, agree to do the presentation. So I'd like to thank Anton Towns from GCAS uh, for, for, for coming on board, and uh, John Barry and Owen O'Driscoll, uh, who are experts in this field. And it would be interesting to see uh, what they have to say. And uh, we'll have a discussion now. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so, uh, yeah, so I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview about APTN, where it came from, why it's in existence. And I'm not going to do a lot of talking. There's a few short videos here. And it will, uh, it will hopefully explain, and uh, you'll be able to uh, catch me afterwards. I won't, I won't interrupt the, the uh, seminar. Catch me afterwards if you have any questions or if you want more info on it. But hopefully you'll see more and more of these seminars and, and uh, uh, um, workshops, either in Dublin or in Shannon or elsewhere, as you'll see in the presentations. So this is the agenda for today. Uh, I'm going to give the introduction. Uh, we'll have John then going to give an overview of suppliers and uh, what companies do in this space. Uh, Anton will, will give us an overview of uh, SPEC 2500 electronic records. And he'll also talk a little bit about the non-incident statements and accident incident statements. And then finally, we'll have uh, Owen uh, giving an uh, introduction to distributed ledger technology, app chain, and spinning switch. Uh, blockchain. Uh, we had a, another item on the agenda. I was trying to, in, to bring in something on uh, uh, aircraft records on the commercial side. The commercial trade is also a big issue in the, in the record side and uh, the, uh, the, the, um, there was a legal uh, expert going to come on board but couldn't make it today. But if we do this again in the new year, uh, we'll have that, that, that item on the agenda hopefully. So we're recording this uh, workshop on Zoom, uh, and it will be, if it, if it looks good, we'll broadcast it early next week on LinkedIn, uh, APTN uh, Aviation Group page. If anybody wants uh, a copy of it, let me know, but uh, we'll have to maybe edit it down over the weekend. But it can be available there if you think the content is useful and you want to share it, uh, you feel free to do that. So a, I'm going to finish talking for a few minutes now. There's a short uh, video clip here that explains APTN. This is a summary that, uh, that I did after the first workshop. So it's some references to the first workshop, but I think you'll get the picture. Welcome everybody to the first APTN uh, technical workshop at the New York facility in Dublin. Do you know there is no professional body with thousands of technical consultants, engineers, record analysts, project managers working in the aviation industry, either as technical consultants or as full-time employees. The Aircraft Professionals Technical Network is a newly formed professional body for aircraft technical professionals. It was created in 2019 to address a concern in the industry and to fill that gap. My name is Alan Phelan and I am the founder of APTM. My background is in aircraft engineering and jet engine overhaul, having worked with Aer Lingus, Lufthansa Technique, and HTR Tech in the past. Before we get into the detail, I would like to give you an insight into APTN, what it's about, and what it hopes to achieve. The purpose of APTN is to provide a platform to aircraft technical professionals that will give them access to tools and services that enhance their career and provides continuous professional development that will raise standards in the industry. Here is a short animation that explains the APTM concept in brief. Sometimes you can be one of many, but yes, you feel like something is missing. There are almost half a million highly skilled technical professionals working in the aircraft industry worldwide. Yet amazingly, no dedicated professional body exists for their mutual benefit and career development. Hard to believe. Well, we think it's high time that all changed. 
That's precisely what we've done by creating the Aircraft Professionals Technical Network, or APTN for short. APTN's mission is to be the best and most comprehensive professional body for aircraft technical consultants around. Utilizing a customized website and mobile app, APTN provides you with a calendar app to highlight to the industry what your skills are and when you are available for projects, a parts and price search app, a technical data search engine, online technical training and webinars, and group rates for insurance and other financial and health products. As you can see, APTN means business and we look forward to welcoming you. Joining is easy. Just join our APTN LinkedIn Aviation Hub group page at Aviation Hub APTN to become an early adopter of the APTN organization and keep up to date on developments, new hubs and the APTN website and app launch dates. APTN, because the sky isn't the limit for aircraft professionals like us. There are two aspects to the APTN, the virtual one and the physical one. The virtual one, as you've seen in the animation, will be in the form of a customized members-only website and app that will provide the following tools and services to the members. It provides members with a calendar app to highlight to the industry what the members' skills are and when they are available for projects, a parts and price search app, a technical data search engine, online technical training and webinars, and group rates for insurance and other financial and health products. Here are some screenshots of the website and app in development, and we hope to launch this in January 2020. More info is available at aptn.ero. The physical side of APTN will be in the form of APTN Aviation Hubs. Over time, we hope to have similar hubs and other work sharing facilities at aviation centers worldwide. Sometimes you can be one of many, but yes, you feel like something is missing. Are you an aviation startup company or are you looking to enter? Yeah, I just, I mean, I'll finish up then, the video online later. Uh, APTN Aviation Hub idea is that we will have uh, physical locations worldwide uh, using spaces like the WeWork facility that I'm in in Dublin. Uh, the idea would be that technical consultants that are members might be team leaders in, in those spaces. Uh, the, the, the LinkedIn group page, which was set up only a couple of months ago, has over 350 members already. And these are what I call the uh, early adopters of the APTN concept. Uh, so uh, when it goes live, website and app in January, I would hope these early adopters will be the first ones that will be full members of the organization and uh, uh, would help grow it and spread the word. And it would be seen and recognized industry as, as a as the place for aircraft technical professionals uh, to uh, congregate. So uh, membership of the organization, uh, if you look at the website, uh, you can see uh, members are, it's pitched at 400 euros per year. For that, you get access to all of these webinars, uh, technical uh, workshop information, uh, and then the uh, access to the tools and apps that will be on the website when it goes live in January. Uh, over time, so in January, what we have is, is, is what's called a minimal viable product. So it has the, the basic services and tools there. Over time, we'll add other uh, menu items, online training, 
uh, provided by different service providers, uh, maybe access some technical data as well. Uh, on the services side, uh, as well as insurance products, there may be health products, financial products, but the idea there is you'll get group rates because it's a professional body, and with more members, those rates will come down. So anybody that's working independently uh, as a tech rep will be able, be able to see value for money in the annual membership fee. Like it's pitched at 400 euros per year, which is similar to the, a daily rate for a, for a technical guy out there. So I think you will see there is value for money there. Even now, if, if, if you join, um, not only will you get access to the content of these workshops, but uh, you get access to a member's area, which is Google Drive, and we'll be adding more and more info on there as time, time goes by. So, so that's the APTN professional body. That's my main kind of mission at the moment, is try to get up and running. I'm talking to some senior uh, technical consultants worldwide that are interested in coming on board as uh, technical advisors, uh, technical board members, and they would hopefully help me drive it in the right direction. Uh, and if you know of anybody that's interested to, to, uh, to come on to that uh, uh, type of a panel, let me know. Uh, apart from, from uh, doing this uh, particular project, I'm also helping a few other uh, companies that are in a startup mode uh, to get into the aviation space. And, and that's what the APTN Aviation Hub is about, is trying to encourage startups uh, and, and people that aren't familiar with the space. And uh, the, the first location, like I said, in Dublin is, is, is doing that. Just a couple of examples of projects I've worked on recently. Uh, locally here, um, uh, I worked with uh, Tempest Fugit Aviation Services to help them uh, source an engine for a training school here in Shannon. And we just uh, did a photo shoot on it uh, earlier today. Um, picture is gone, is it? There it is, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, the, uh, the guys down in this Shannon Clare Educational Training Board now have a CFM 56-3 engine, which they can use for training locally here. So that was through a combination of myself, the guys from Tempest Fugit, uh, and also um, uh, the local guys here. So that's that's one project we worked on. The second project that 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 is uh, that is uh, coming to fruition is a new entrant into the uh, the, the vinyl decals on aircraft. There's a company in Dublin called uh, Esmark Finch, who I've helped to introduce them to the aviation space in Dublin and to some airlines. And uh, they're they've just got their first customer around the last few weeks for uh, decals on an aircraft from an airline in Germany. So yeah, there are just some examples of some stuff that's happening around the APTN. But like I said, the main mission is to get the, this uh, professional network up and running. And uh, then um, uh, we go from there. So thanks. That's my bit. And we'll move on to the next item on the agenda, which is John. <laughs> Okay, thanks very much for coming along and thank uh, Alan for organising and facilitating the um, workshop today. Um, so, obviously I'm, I'm going to talk about digital records and, and start off the conversation and just look at uh, you know, how the market has evolved over the last uh, number of years. So, uh, just to introduce myself, so John Barry is my name, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Director of Business Development with Compass Aviation Group. Uh, Compass Aviation Group have been around for about 14 years, headquartered out of Oklahoma, and uh, have opened the office here in Ireland uh, just at the beginning of this year. And we have now established ourselves here to help focus on the building up the brand that we have established over the last 14 years. Uh, what we offer is technical consultancy, and um, we specialize then in aviation records uh, software solutions. So I'm going to start with a comparison in, in my lifetime and how the, the times have changed over the last 40 years. It's actually closer to 50, but uh, we, we won't exaggerate the, uh, in that side. So in, in the start of the 70s, you know, when I was born, so was leasing was born, and there were no lease transitions and nobody had to worry about paper records uh, that were going back on. So it was just as well when we consider the technology that was available at the time and also the age that I was at that time. So. 
when we move on and you know consider when I was 10 years in, into the, the industry in the early 2000s there were you know two and a half thousand plus aircraft or 24 percent of the world's operating fleet uh, were, were on um, were on lease the technology had uh, started to, to mature uh, and I also had started to mature a little bit at that time as well so what we had in that time in, in realistic terms was the, probably the first transitions I started to do around that time, there were two of us in a room, okay, and there were, we were surrounded by boxes and paper records. And as many discrepancies as I could find on one side of the table, my counterpart could solve on the other side of the table. And that was the reality. And you would have at the end of that transition period, typically hundreds of discrepancies or defects. And that's what, what we lived with and everybody was happy and the aircraft transitioned. And then we talked about digitizing the system, okay? So when we move that on to, to present times and look at more recently in 2017, there were over 8,000 aircraft commercially uh, and operating lease, which is 42% of the world's fleet. So you can see where the, the growth areas are coming. Technology has allowed us to actually digitize the, the aircraft records. And you know today we have the technology, but do we have the processes put in place to keep that in, in place? At the same time, I've matured also. <laughs> that was 2017 as opposed to today. The last two years have not been good for me. <laughs> but in reality, what we have at this point in time then is we still have two people in a room, okay? And in the, but those two people are now supported remotely by teams. So on the airline side, you now have got your airframe specialist, your landing air specialist, your structural specialist. And the question is, are the leasing industry keeping pace with what the airlines are doing? Because now you have a typical transition that it wouldn't be unusual to have two and a half, three thousand discrepancies. It's the same aircraft, it's the same records, but because of the remote access and the specialist skills that are available, you have far more discrepancies to actually answer. So I'm going to take a look at the, you know, how the industry is changing, and we talk about innovations. Okay, so in 2018, 1,000 aircraft were sold or traded under lease. Okay, now if we take those and we say it's not sustainable for the industry to continue that, the industry won't be able to manage that volume of, of trades if we continue in, in paper transitions. This is from a legal perspective. So the Aviation Working Group have designed GATS, the Global Aircraft Trading System. That's aiming to streamline the process. So the legal and commercial people are moving forward and, uh, and creating a system that will allow them to have a fully digital transfer of the aircraft lease by on operating lease, okay? Now, that's going to launch in the first quarter of 2020. And the question that people have to ask themselves is, what's going to be the pinch point? What department is going to stop the transaction taking place? And it's going to come back to the technical aspect of the aircraft transition. So what, what's happening in the market to, to keep, keep, keep the pace with, with those who are walking around? So I'm looking at the systems that are in, in place at the moment, and I'm not going to go through any particular system because I don't think it's right for me because I obviously I represent Compass and Elevate, but I'm putting up on, on the screen stream. It's been around since uh, 20 years. Carl will probably tell you more if he uh, comes forward. Fly docks um, are slightly newer entrant into the market owned uh, by Lufthansa Systems. Airfoil is now owned by GE and part of the ATS system. And then they have that the local system cloud card, you've got Acumen Aviation with uh, Sparta, and of course you've got uh, Elevate by Compass. So those are the systems that are out there. And there, there are other systems out there as well. I'm not going to exclusively say these are the only systems, but I'm saying these are the ones that are leading the, the market in terms of what's available. So I would now normally go on and talk about ATS Spec 2000, how these systems are compliant. It should be able to transfer records between each other. Anton is going to speak to you on that. So I'm not going to concentrate on that side of it. And what I'm going to look at is how we might look at what system, what a system should have and its capabilities. And it's about bringing your people and the information into a single place, okay? And we delve down into that and you should be looking at the, the content services, the process uh, 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 and the platform. So the platform services, what's the technology based upon? The administration and security, the governance and, NIC and risk, how you can collaborate with interdepartmentally, how it integrates to other systems. Does it have business analytics and reporting? Can you automate your processes? Can you remove the mundane tasks from 
um, the, the person and automate it through AI and robotics. And that's through process designers, task management and rules management. And then obviously the, the digital records themselves, the document you capture, how is it captured? How can it be used? How can it be extracted when you do need it? And then the actual rules for document management. So they're the things that you should be looking at at any of the systems and ask yourself uh, the questions what you're going to do because the traditional systems that are in place now the result in siloed information so they're held on across repositories file shares network drives usb drives they're everywhere including paper uh, and some, some of them are in the cloud it's about streamlining what you have into a single source that everybody can access when and where they need it and access the bits that they need so all document management systems should have five basic components it's the capturing of the, the data how you import it in the archival and storage of that data, the retrieval and distribution of it once you have it, the business process automation that you can tie to that, and how secure you can act, give access to people remotely and, and through remote access. So there are five key components that people should be looking at. The legacy systems are gonna bring in challenges like you know, labor intensive duplication, slow distribution, misplaced of originals, and it's time consuming and inconvenient. So by putting in a proper document management solution, you should be able to look at time saving, raising your bottom line, increasing productivity, including improving your interdepartmental communication and enabling automation of your processes. So again, what, what can you do once you automate it? You have the ability to send out you know, the documents via email directly from the system. You can have backups. You're complying with, uh, with Sarbanes Oxley and, and the other regulatory compliance um, solutions are regulatory compliance regulations that are out there. These are the advantages of putting in any of the, the solutions that are available, the modern solutions that are available out there. So if you're looking for a solution, I would suggest you create a checklist, okay? And creating a checklist and looking for how does it capture data? How does it index it? How does the search and retrieval work? What's the distribution method? What's the document management, the records management? I could go through all of those We've actually created here, and I can pass it around and share a 10 page checklist of what you should be looking for in a system. I'm not going to spend the next you know, two hours going through the single um, points you can make, but there's an 11 page checklist of items that you should be looking for and considering. But they're the key items that I would be looking for and making sure that whatever system you select uh, or whatever system you have meets those requirements as, as an absolute minimum. So when you enable your workforce, in a digital system, you will allow them to work from anywhere, which means you get the best people to do, to do the job because not everybody is in a position to travel. Okay, remote work is not like this as much as people like to think it is, but what it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be like this. Okay, it's a fact, clinically proven, that those people who travel long and frequent trips away from home essentially end up worse off health wise. Okay, you can see the actual. The, the, the reasons there and the obesity when I stand uh, over myself. So who can sustain lifestyles like this? And the truth is we can get the young and the mobile and I'll ask you the question, I'm not going to answer it. Are they the people you want with the relevant experience levels to represent you out there on the front line? And also you can get the people who have been there, seen that and done that. How many of those are available and can you fill all your resources from that pool of people? You're not necessarily getting the there's a middle cohort of people that have great skills. And then I would also ask you, and look around you, I think it answers the question, are we getting the right gender mix in our organization? Because the not having remote work is not necessarily as attractive for everybody. And I don't think we're actually getting the right people. And I, certainly in my past, in organizations I've worked on, some of the best technical records people were female. And yet, look around you, we're in a room of mostly uh, male people. So, are you ready and truly ready for digital transformation? Because it's not just about software, it's about transforming the way that you work. Okay? There is a, a book um, called the, 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 uh, the Customer of the Day After Tomorrow from 2017, and it outlines three different types of DNA in your digital organization. And there's type one, type two, and type three. And type one being those lessors or uh, airlines from the mid 70s to the mid 90s. There's type two, which are in the second phase of digitalization from the mid to late 90s up to now the third phase. And the third phase 
phase of organizations have the ability to select the most modern tools and base their systems uh, upon that, that their processes are fresh and they have an opportunity to use the tools. So as head of technical, as SVP technical, project manager, it doesn't matter, you should understand what is your company's digital uh, DNA, and that will allow you to, to focus on what type of, of tools you should be looking for and what can you bring in. Some of the questions you should be asking yourself are, how long has your company been around and take into account any mergers or name changes it's had over the year? I mean, there's, we all know there's less hours and if you turn around, they've changed their name, they've changed their personnel, but it's the same company that's actually behind it. Um, what's the age profile of the people that you're working with and how is it distributed? Are you all, you know, at Generation X? Are you all um, in, in the millennials, whatever? Or is there a good mix in there? And that's going to determine what level of training is going to be required and not just on the system, but on the technology that, that's underlying. And then finally, you know, how long will you be able to continue your operation if the systems go down? Have you, you know, a paper backup? What are the processes that you're dependent upon? And once you've done that and you've actually understood which type of organization you are and what your DNA spectrum you're on, you can move forward to selecting and implementing uh, a, a solution. So I'm going to just finish off with a couple of tips that, you know, um, I spent almost 14 years in the software side of things, both on the M&E side and, and in, on the digital records. Start with the end in mind. When you're starting the process, think where you want to get to. Okay, it's just not about selecting the software, it's about what, what goals do you want to achieve by implementing the solution in the first place. Then uh, have a proper solution design phase. Once you get to the point of uh, selecting the software, understand how it's going to transform your business. And it covers not just the software, but the organizational structure, the job roles, the responsibilities, the resources, the reporting needs. Think about it right from the very beginning through the selection phase. You know, and once you're, you're in the, the project, make sure you set up a proper governance structure. If you've set up too big, nothing will get done. If you set up too small, it will derail the project. So getting the right people involved, having the right levels in the organization from somebody running the project and people who are actually doing the work on the ground. And realize, which is probably the most important point of the whole lot, I've mentioned it three times, it's not about just implementing the software, or selecting the software, it's about seeing that your organization is capable of transforming the way that it works and using the tools that are now available uh, out there. And finally, communication, communication, communication. From the very beginning, get your end users involved in the process. There is no point in you saying, I've got the system, it's fantastic reporting capabilities, it's everything that I want, I'm signing the check. If your guy, your tech consultant out in the, the field can't get the information inside there in the first place, if your data analysts can't put that from structure to unstructured, from unstructured to structured data, there's no point, it's not going to report anything, because people won't use it, and it'll end up all of a sudden drop boxes and, and you're back to where you, where you started from. So get the end users involved in the process. So I'll go back to the, the, the options that are available. You know, I've spoken about what you should be looking for, what the systems are capable of. Ultimately, it's up to you to make a decision, you know, which, which way you go. I won't uh, make any decision for you. Just leave the last slide up there for <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, we were looking to get a room. Thanks, 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 if, if this is an organization that's thinking about records consultants, and hopefully some of you in the room or other consultants are thinking about it, um, to build on what John said, the prediction is that today in the world there's about 3.2 billion middle class people, primarily in Europe, the US, Canada, Australia. 
prediction is that will grow to about 5.3 billion middle class people. Why do middle class people matter? Well, it's because middle class people get on an aircraft and fly it in a commercial aircraft. If you're super rich, you have your own aircraft, so you don't bother with commercial flights. And if you're at the stage where you're still worrying about food and shelter and feeding your children and their education, you're not flying either. So that 2 billion growth in middle class will all fly. If you have any doubt on that, go to any of the tourist attractions in Ireland or the UK or France, and you will see Chinese people everywhere. Now, the Chinese only have 2.3 aircraft per million population, and yet they're appearing everywhere in Europe. In Europe here, we have almost 10 aircraft per million people. So that extra 2 billion people is going to grow the world's fleet. And today, the estimate is somewhere around 22, 24,000 commercial aircraft. The expectation from both Boeing and Airbus is that will grow to about 45 or 48,000 aircraft. So to John's point, it's just not sustainable to keep going on paper and running paper systems. I think the other thing John mentioned that I thought was particularly relevant is these type one, type two, and type three companies. Um, the problem for us as a lessor is our customers are type one, type two, and type three. <coughs> we have EasyJet in the UK who have automated and linked everything uh, and are doing electronic signatures. And we have customers in China who absolutely cannot see any reason to move anything other than paper. So for us, the challenge has been the breadth, the breadth of difference across the, the world. And frankly, that breadth of difference is not only with our customers, the airlines, it's also with some of the buyers, so you talked about innovating aircraft, and it's also with the regulators. And frankly, the regulators have been the big challenge around trying to move to electronic records. Uh, so that's a nice introduction to Spec 2500. Um, like John, I'm an IT geek, so I don't know a huge amount about aircraft and records. So I do pick a bit of up along the way. And I thought all we had to do was knock out a good standard for electronic records and just bang it out there in the marketplace and we should go. But actually, it's a little bit more difficult than that. And so there are three sort of key stakeholders in this. Um, there is those of us who are moving the aircraft around, primarily lessors, but also the airlines. And we need to sort of deal with them. And we also need to then think about the regulators. And so we've ended up with these sort of three pillars of activity that have been running along to make Spec 2500 plausible. One, any IT geek will tell you, if you're going to automate a process, you need to know what it is you're going to automate. And so we've had to spend quite an amount of time trying to harmonize what everybody wants to transfer in and out uh, at a lease return or a lease commencement. And we have to get that agreement with the regulators and we've also had to get it with the airlines. And so via ICAO, we now have a, a list of the required documents from a regulatory perspective in a document <coughs> called 9760. Um, if you're in the business, you probably know 9760, but 9760 is the document that ICAO uses to explain the regulations to national authorities. So it goes directly from ICAO out to the national authority, it bypasses government completely. Um, and it's supposed to be a quick change document that they can change every so often and just update the industry and what's going on. It's only been revised three times since 1947, so perhaps not that quick. But revision three that came out a couple of years ago now has now got a list of the documents that from a regulatory perspective every country in the world should want to give and get when it's returning or delivering an aircraft. So if you're in the business and you're a, you're a, a consultant on site, this is sort of a vital piece of information for you. Easily accessible through the ICAO website. Building on top of that, because there are some commercial documents, some of which I violently disagree with, but anyway, that need to be added on top of that to make a checklist that we move an aircraft from an airline to an airline with. And so working with both IATA and the AWG, we now have a published checklist. Again, uh, it's in the IATA guidance material for aircraft leases, the uh, fourth edition, and it's in the second annex, easy to find as well if you go online. And so that lists a standard records checklist that all of the AWG members, which is a large number of the, of the larger aircraft lessors, and theoretically all of the airlines who are in IATA, which again is a large number of the airlines in the world, have all agreed to and signed up to. 
adoption may be somewhat different, but at least theoretically, they've all signed up to it. So we should all be asking for and giving the same set of records, GCAS along with everybody else. So that's been pillar one. It's sort of harmonizing what it is we all want to get. The second piece has then been around acceptance. And I think by definition, regulators are somewhere around type one companies. Um, if you look in the actual Chicago convention, it doesn't say anywhere that records have to be on paper. It just says records have to be kept. But in 1947, there weren't too many other options around. And so paper has become the de facto standard. So if GCAS turns up with a big pile of paper to an airline and its national authority, the uh, national authority and the airline have tended to go through the paperwork and read the content, which is sort of precisely what we want them to do. When we turn up with a CD or any other electronic medium, I'm, I'm pretty old, um, key fobs and things I believe are possible nowadays, the conversation immediately moves around to what system produced the records. What sort of security was in that system? What sort of backup? Could there be records missing? They didn't look at the content, they just started talking about the system. But if you think about it, a manual system has all of those problems too. At the worst, you could pay a half mad anti Mary to sit in the corner with a bottle of gin and write records on paper. Be a very dubious quality, but, but it would work. But the assumption is airlines in the world are running good manual systems because their national authorities require them to. So why does that assumption not transfer across to the electronic world? And so we said to ICAO, we were going to be back to them after we finished nagging them about changing 9760. We said, we're going to be back on electronic records. And actually ICAO said, no, we recognize this problem. We'll do something about it. And so they set up a work program. And they moved pretty quickly. And in early 2018, on the ICAO website, they published some new guidance material on electronic records. Now our ask was that they would treat paper and electronic equally and they just look at the content. But actually this guidance material goes further and it recommends to national authorities that to drive safety standards, uh, airlines need to be going electronic. It is sort of a statement of the obvious because most airlines have electronic m and &E systems and a lot of them are bringing on board one of those electronic record keeping systems. And in fact, a lot of our customers give out to us that we want paper because they don't have any paper. But anyway, they said it to all of the national authorities worldwide you should be going electronic. Electronic allows you to get much greater levels of security and safety and much greater speed in terms of, of information retrieval. And so now that, that guidance material is out there. It was supposed to go into 9760, but they held off changing 9760. I don't think they could cope with it. Changed twice in four years. Um, the speed was just beyond them. But anyway, that material is up there and it will go into whatever the next revision of 9760 is, which I told is due the end of this year, beginning of next year. But you can access it on site already. And then with IATA, we also have, um, you know, we, sorry, I've mentioned this before, we have the guidance material there. So that, that lines up with this, and then this says it should be electronic. And it says if you produce and use electronic records, you can tie that to your export C of A. So it is really driving all of the national authorities to say we should be using, accepting and giving electronic records. So that's been the second pillar of work that has been ongoing. And then finally, the third piece is this spec 2500, which is if you like the enabler. If we can agree this and we've agreed to this, then this is how we should do it. And for those of you who are IT type geeks, spec is sim spec 2500 is simply an XML language standard, which has been around for about 30 or 35 years. Um, and it's a, if you actually see it, you can almost read it. And if you're not an IT person, think of spec 2500 like a glossary of terms. So it says an AD, this is what it is. The word AD means this, and here are the parameters that you would supply with an AD. Maybe the AD number, the AD incorporation date. If there's a, a revision date on it, you might have that. But for each item of records, there is a definition of the item and the uh, relevant parameters that go with it. And so if you're a computer programmer, you just need to program to that standard. You write using those verbs and nouns, and you put in the right parameters on each one, 
and then another system comes along, it's able to read those words, those verbs and nouns, and it's able to interpret them. It's just a simple glossary of terms. And what we produce effectively is an electronic crate. Now for us as a lessor, the crate just needed to contain the records, the paper records electronically scanned or whatever, and just linked up with enough data to recognize what each piece of paper was. But if you think about it from an airline's perspective, whether they get the paper as a well, the record, sorry, as a pile of paper, or they get the records as a set of PDFs, they still need to go through them, take the relevant information they need, and type it into their ME system, which is kind of pointless in this day and age. So what SPEC 2500 allows us to do is either reference the paper or include all of the data. And so the hope is that instead of just getting a last done next year as a report, you get a last done next year as a set of data. So the data would come across and could be read into an m &E system and the record could be filed away with the stamp on it. So we'd be all sure it's right, or at least assure ourselves it's right. And so you can do that for all of the main constituent data. So last done next year, ADs, SBs, repairs, fitted component lists. And there's even a section where you can describe the aircraft as like a one page text type. So when you get a record crate electronically, you know it's an aircraft 737, it's a serial number, it's this, it's got two of these sort of engines, here's the serial numbers, times and skew, cycles and skew, the very basic text spec stuff, so that at least you can recognize what set of records you're looking at. So this is very simply, you know, an enabler. So Stream, Airvault, and Flydocs have all said they're working on it. Um, we for reasons that are fairly obvious, I would say, are currently uh, um, air vault users, so ATS, and we know it definitely can read them in, and we have written them out, literally file import and file export. Um, and everybody else is working on it similarly, as indeed are both AMOS and Trax that I know of who are M&E system providers. So they're looking much more at the data side. These guys are looking much more at the scanned image side. But if you have one of these and one of these as an airline, they're usually linked somehow by the magic protocol. And so the hope is that in the medium to long term, we can easily pull out a set of data and a set of paper, put them all together in the crate and move them across to the other customer. And for the customer, for the airlines, what that means is no more typing, no more transferring last done next year lists or component fitted lists and putting them into your m and system. So that should cut out time, money, and indeed uh, potential for errors. And so that's, that is in one page summary where we are with spec 2500. All of the bits are live, all of the bits are up to date. We had a meeting last month in Ennis in County Clare, um, where we brought in anybody who's been working on spec 2500. And basically the question was, how was it for you? <coughs> Um, had we found any errors or problems or difficulties? Now there were a few suggestions from minor improvements, but overall everybody who's tried it agreed it works. The glossary is understandable. Perhaps we could put a bit more of an explanation in for programmers who've not seen it before, but it works. And there was no fundamental findings. So anyone who says Spec 2500 doesn't work, I wouldn't believe them. It does work if it's programmed properly. And that's all I have to say on spec 2500. If I kick something here, will it move forward? Yes, it will. This is what I want. I said to you, I'm not an aircraft person. I am mad to burn a set of paper records. <laughs> I do not, people say they've done electronic <coughs> record transfers, but you will generally find, in fact, I think exclusively you will find that somewhere in the background, they put all of the boxes of paper on an aircraft and they ship the paper. I don't want to ship the paper, I want to burn the paper. So, uh, what in fact is that happening in the GE carbon footprint there? Now? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I'm, I'm told after watching that program on RTE recently that I, we, actually I shouldn't want to burn the paper, I should want to recycle the paper, <laughs> something more useful. I still want a bonfire, I want at least one symbolic bonfire. <laughs> and we did deliver one set of records electronically this year, but I suspect, we, we can't get the PM to admit it, but I think the PM shipped the paper in the background, he couldn't let me burn it. Um, we are going to deliver 14 aircraft this year, absolutely. 
2020, absolutely electronic records only. The returning airline doesn't actually have paper. They're in breach of their contract. So that actually suits me. Um, so we will deliver 14 aircraft in 2020, and there will be no paper. That will probably be the first time I've, we've seen it. I don't know about any other ones. So if you're in the record consulting business, bonfires are a really good thing. Uh, the other item I was asked to talk a little bit about is the incident clearance statement or the blasted old fashioned non incident statement. There's a gentleman called Mr. Dillon down the back of the room. <laughs> now, now of Nordic fame. Um, and it is with thanks to him that the next two slides come up. Um, he did all of the work really on this. Um, the non-incident statement offends me on a number of levels. In fact, despite my age, it offended my mother as well in her, when she was alive. Um, she hated anyone who abused the English language. Um, and there is no airline in the world, or no professional in an airline in the world who should ever, ever, ever have signed a non-incident statement. They are lying, completely lying. An incident, as defined by the regulators, includes things like a 500 foot deviation from flight level. If there's turbulence on the aircraft and one of the cabin crew falls and breaks their nose, that's an accident, not an incident. Incidents are such small things, it is ridiculous. So how did anyone ever sign a non-incident statement? How did anyone believe it when it arrived? Boeing said they've had 1,900 uh, hard landings on their 777 fleet. They only have 1,000 of them. <laughs> they've had two each, roughly. Maybe, on, maybe there's a distribution there, but they've had two each. That's an incident. Is that an accident or an incident? I can't remember. <coughs> hard land, sorry, hard lands are a reportable incident. As I say, if the cabin crew member breaks his or her nose, that's an accident. And, you know, the European Centre for Accidents said they'd recorded 664,000 occurrences between 2005 and 2012. My poor mother was right. It's just an abuse of the English language. Um, and so, what we've done is we've gone to the incident clearance statement. <coughs> And the incident clearance statement simply says either the aircraft hasn't had a, ever had an accident or an incident, pretty unlikely, or if it has, that it has been repaired and corrected in accordance with the uh, requirements of the regulators and the type certificate holders. In a nutshell, that's what it says. And then it has one other line in it which says, honestly, none of the parts came from military aircraft. And I never discovered, I never realized how much of a debate you could have over what was military. But anyway, so our aircraft generally do not have any parts in them that came from a military aircraft um, anyway. And as I say, if the aircraft's had an incident or an accident, it's been cleared. It's fine. Carry on, please. So if any of you are actually practitioners in the business, please, please, please do not run around looking for non-incident statements. You're just asking people to lie. Paul, is there anything I have missed in that rant? <laughs> and I, it, it, I, it is, the non-incident statement is something we really want to try and get out of the industry. And how, how far down the road do you see before the non, uh, NIS goes away? GCAS has not signed or looked for a non-incident statement in the last five years. And we won't sign one. We will not do it. If we give you one of these clearance statements, we will not sign a non-incident statement. I think, I think, you know, I think it's almost habit. Like, the, I heard that some airlines have forms when and they're trying to get people to bid for supplying supply of components. And one of the questions is, will you ever supply a component from an aircraft that's had an incident? And if you click yes, that's the end of you, you won't be on the list. I mean, I think we've just got to try and educate people who are saying that. There is no aircraft that hasn't had an incident. There isn't one. So if you don't want to buy any parts, that's fine. Tick that box. But otherwise, the aircraft had an incident. And planes that are on board as well, I guess. Say again? Kicked off with the AWG supporting it. Yeah. 
the stable on board, which I guess in essence is all of the lessors that are part of the AWG. We then engage IATA, which represents a lot of the OEMs and airlines who support them. So both AWG and IATA have said the accident incident clearance statement is the way to go. So it's available on their website, they advocate it. Now, there is another argument which says the regulations, if you read them properly, say if an aircraft's been involved in an accident, the stuff needs to be repaired or scrapped if it can't be repaired. So the regs are actually quite clear. There shouldn't be any parts in the system that are faulty. They might have been on an aircraft that's had an accident, but they're not faulty. Doesn't that uh, beg the question, what practical purpose does either of those statements have? I, I don't see it. You're likely to get me off in a second round. <laughs> no, sorry. 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 Is it, going back is back is it not driven by the secondary market and the, the breakout of the aircraft? Is that, it, is that what's causing it, it, the... It's driven by the secondary market, but the regs already covered it perfectly well, so it was never a requirement. It has become a standard. But it, it's predominantly being uh, asked for by in end-of-life scenarios or in a hard-out scenario where the particular set of vendors are looking for non-instant statements, you know, to the extent that you're nearly being asked to go back and uh, give a search for the bauxite that's been mined from the quarry that produced the aluminium, you know, so where does it ever end, you know? Well, if that comes from as well as the likes of the, the Lufthansa's and the MTUs of this world, when they do come out for a part, they will insist on an NIS. Yeah. Okay, so they the whole thing. Somebody gets one of those requests from uh, Lufthansa or something. I'd very much like to see it, please. Honestly, I would very much like to see it. I will go and talk to somebody in Lufthansa. I'll take your card, I'll send it. Right. And it's a huge thing, right? That they have a checklist of what they need when they're doing back to work on an LLP or on a component, and they will ask for an NIS. And it's just because it's. And they probably ask for an NIS after they operate, but they're operating until the end. The, the onus is on you know the senior management within the company that's selling the part to push back and say, well, then you won't sell the part. Understood. But yeah. at some stage, somebody's got to make a stand on this because. Well, and GCAT, and look, GCAT is happy to make a bit of a stand yeah. on this. So if somebody well, gives me some information, I will have to make a statement here rather than on the yeah, I'll have to translate non incident into yeah. German, but anyway. Yeah. So there's a bigger discussion is going, which is standardization with respect to back to work trays and the parts. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, to be fair, the AWG and IATA, they, are, they have started working groups to address and, and try and come up with a, a de facto standard, I guess, for back to work trays. And it should be, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was at the G Lesser Conference um, last month in, in Berlin, or actually this month, started this month, uh, G Aviation Materials would be a bit fair in this place. They were promoting the use of the incident clearance statement. So I think when you get big players like that supporting it, I think naturally over time, you know, the rest should get on board. I think it's, I think it's, a, it's a practical solution. To it. And look, I think you know, if people like Lufthansa are doing the other, I think we just need to kind of go around and point out to them where, where the industry is. Yeah, and it's, it's, a, it's a vicious circle. Of course it is, yeah. If you're a small you player, some parts. You can go right around, back up again, and then put some yeah. Yeah, the, the allegation is that lesser started this, but anyway, I don't know if it's true. I wouldn't say that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But in reality, there's always going to be a tension between the commercial and the local. Yeah. Uh, and since you said standard, it's not being commercial world, it's going to try to publish it. Yeah. Just tell everyone to have But like, to be clear, the regulatory world, and you probably know better come from the MRO environment, the regulatory world has this well addressed. Thou shalt not put damaged, faulty parts back on airplanes. You scrap them. Well, then I guess it's sufficient. They're happy with the, the incident clearance statement, but they themselves in turn have uh, a demand for funding that says full transportation back to work on NAS is ridiculous. It is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. But uh, they, they too are just responding to, to the market. And I, I guess until somebody takes a break, it's time to Maybe, maybe GE is the one to do it. Well, I think also, I mean, I think IATA and the AWG are trying to take stances on this sort of thing. You know, GATS is ours, and the extent convention is an AWG thing as well. Like, I think we can try and get the industry to take a stance on this. Can I have one comment? Everybody's preaching from the altar about getting rid of it, but then when you sign the sale process agreement with the TFM or G, they want the old style piece of paper. 
That's a fact. And they're from most, as of last month, they are from That's all, everyone's talking. Yeah. Yeah. We're talking as here. Yeah. So again, which again, if you have some examples, can you send them on? I'm, certainly if it's Jim, I'm very happy to go and have a conversation. Yeah, right. We'll send it back a copy of our presentation. So Jim uh, Jim are supposed to definitely to stop. Supposed to have. But you, again, it's like all of the list, all of the national authorities in the world have been told they should go to electronic records. But you know, I bet you if we all go out in the morning and offer electronic records in certain parts of the world. It's going to be a very stony and cold reception. You know, these things take time. But if you have some examples, send them to me and I'll see what I can do. TFM as well, and their TFM materials, they would say they're true engine parts, that they were part of the whole involved in the work the group in the beginning with Airbus and Boeing and agreed this was a brilliant idea. They said around at the conference about, oh, yeah, but we won't, well, we'll accept the United stacks of yours, but we consider it's worth nothing. We still have to pull trays back to cross for everything. And at the conference, everyone was going to have two years ago in San Francisco and said, you were, you were involved in this work we did. And uh, they're like, yeah, but we, we don't recognize it. No, we do recognize it when we sell it, but not when we buy it. Yeah. And that, that is the big problem. Oh, the yes. 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 I, if the OEMs make the big change, everyone can follow. But at the moment, people can't follow because if they don't have the industry yeah. piece of paper, they can't sell something. Well, they're restricting their market. Send, send me a few examples and let's see if we can do anything with any of them. I'm not promising anything, but no, no, I know, I mean, it's sorry. easier to do it when you're not in the middle of trying to actually buy or sell a part. You know, than it is when you're in the middle of it. You can't do much when you're yeah, I mean, it, on the mid trail. As, as an example, if you've an instance related aircraft, then the letter can't say something that, that says no. But you're the only person who's being honest then because everybody else is on them fears. They're clearly not true. <laughs> no, no, I understand your comments, uh, and I, 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 I more than agree with you all, but we're often at the back end of, of the equation of trying to get this piece of paper that, that actually allows the sale happen. And it, it's often the. the well, no say, you send me some examples and let's do it when we're not in the middle of doing something. <laughs> Okay, hey, folks. Thanks. Thank you very much, folks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I think the message here as well is spread the word about you know accident incident statements as both NAS and and you know through APTN and through other organisations, not just the industry bodies. I think everybody needs to spread the word. Mm -hmm. So my final speaker then today is Ono Driscoll, and Ono is going to talk to us a little bit from. An IBM perspective on aircraft records and what they're doing in this space. So, John, are you using your own? Or you see? No, I have, you have a ticker. No. The ticker has to go into your Oh, yeah, I But as far as your presentation, yes. Yeah. Starting off, can I commend you on your initiative? I think it's uh, long overdue, and I'm hoping everybody will uh, participate. Uh, the 400 euros is, uh, as you said, it's a daily rate for a good uh, egg rep, um, if you can find one. Um, <laughs> hands up at the back. <laughs> yeah. So look, lovely to be back in Shannon. Um, I've just returned from the desert where I've been uh, down in Dubai for the last uh, three years. Um, and returned in August, so uh, I always love coming back to this part of the world, my wife's in this part of the world, so uh, extended family, uh, catch up with them all later on this evening. It's good to see so many familiar faces, I've worked with many of you, uh, liaised with more more of you, and um, you know, I would say, you know, just a shout out to Anton and uh, even Paul, um, you'd be glad to know that as the CTO of DAE in uh, early 2017, we took uh, 15 aircraft from you, 80 hours, using the 
Kieran saying. Mm -hmm. Oh, so uh, I convinced my CTO, or sorry, my CEO, that 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 was the way to go. Particularly given uh, all of the work that has been done down through the years on the clearance statements, and we took we took that uh, it tranche of APR aircraft just using the clearance statements, and uh, it all went really, really well. Hmm. Um, so I think what it does need is needs some kind of buy-in and a little bit of uh, a little bit of resilience in relation to some of those vendors that are looking for these non-incident statements. Uh, they can't be signed. There isn't an aircraft out there. That as Anton says, that doesn't have some kind of an incident under the uh, uh, ATA definition or the IADA definition. So if you look at those, it's a good way to push back. Take your point, Mike, it's difficult when you're on the other side of the table and you're trying to sell something, you know, mm -hmm. but uh, we, we do need to make a stand on it. So look, um, I've lived a lot of this um, and I've come back to Ireland and when I came back to Ireland, uh, IBM reached out to me and the background to me both working with IBM over the last uh, six months is based around IBM and um, have cotton on to the fact that there's quite a large um, lesser community here in Ireland, hmm. uh, both in Dublin and here in Shannon. Um, and through the various um, uh, conferences that they've been at, they've latched on to the fact that they have an industry, we have an industry here that um, could be ripe for uh, some distributed ledger technology. Hmm. Um, yeah. So most of you would, would know uh, DLT, distributed like ledger technology, as being associated with uh, something that's called blockchain, or you may be more familiar with it in terms of Bitcoin. Um, now, we steer away from using the word Bitcoin in these forums and steer away from the word blockchain in these forums because one, uh, Bitcoin get, gets people a little bit worried in terms of the volatility attached to a cryptocurrency. And there's what's known as blockchain fatigue out there at the moment in relation to everybody's heard about blockchain and how wonderful blockchain would be um, as a um, disruptor within various different industries. Uh, the interesting thing about disruptive technology is that it sits out there on its own, but it needs industry participation and it needs industry uh, professionals to liaise with it in order to uh, give these uh, large technology com uh, companies the use cases that they can work with. And that's what I've been doing over the last six months, is working with IBM in their uh, innovation hub, which is uh, in a place called Dammons Town, just near, near the Blanchestown Shopping Centre. They have 3,000 people working there in uh, a big campus, which would be probably similar to the size of the industrial estate here. Mm -hmm. um, they have uh, been in Ireland since 1956. I was saying to some of the guys earlier, they came originally um, to put the mainframe computers in for the sugar beet industry to ensure that farmers got paid on time. Um, so a gentleman called Derek Overend, they kind of very famous aviation family, they had an airfield house over near uh, Rathfarnham. Uh, he was their um, first person to bring IBM to Ireland um, and farmers got paid uh, within two weeks of the delivery of the sugar beet uh, in the various different factories around the country. Um, prior to that, it was taking them up to six months to a year to get paid. Um, and then there was a lot of problems over actual deliveries. So IBM have been in Ireland for a long time. It's their largest platform, their largest footprint outside the US um, is here in Ireland. So where are we today? Um, a lot of cheap finance available to uh, all of the lessors, hence the numerous lessors. I think that you mentioned the, the acronyms are changing daily. There's mergers and acquisitions. There's new entrants. Uh, we have a few of them here uh, setting up in the building uh, here in Shannon. Um, Having said that, um, you know, there's fierce competition out there uh, and we need to find new innovative ways to deal with um, the problems that were that are arising for us. And one of the major problems that we've been tackling um, is this whole piece of aircraft transitions and particularly technical records. So I took a step back, um, I was the C CTO with Dubai Aerospace. So when I came home, I said, look, take a step back and take a look at this on from a, from a different angle. It's amazing with a bit of time on your hands what you what you can actually do. So they invited me over and I've been spending um, three or four days a week working in their innovation club over in Blanchestown. They gave me an office. They said, come over, 
um, see them in all of their um, predominantly millennials, and uh, I won't have a bad word said about millennials. They're fantastic. <laughs> as long as you keep them, uh, keep them filled full of coffee <laughs> and, uh, and bean bags and sweets and hammocks. <laughs> that's, uh, that's that's the key. <laughs> So uh, half, over half the uh, commercial uh, global fleet is leased. Uh, I think it's at 60% as of 2019. It's even gone up from some of the some of the stats that were shown earlier. That is at over 300 billion US dollars in terms of value. Um, and Ireland manages over 60% of leased aircraft and the demand is increasing. So for a small little country on the, uh, on the western edge of Europe, um, you know, it's 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 a tremendous success story, and it all started a couple of hundred yards down the road on the right hand side with GPA, as you know. Um, so I think we have a we have an environment which is going to lend itself well to what I'm going to talk about. So let me let me carry on a little bit. So the current aircraft leasing process is slow and it's multi-step, and there's six six areas here which we've kind of identified. Um, it's a global process involving many different actors, as you know. It's relatively slow and complex when you compare it to some of the innovations that happened in other industries, and I'll talk a little bit about that in coming on. Um, we, we, we still have missing technical and commercial documentation, no matter what happens, some of that goes missing. Um, there, you know, despite what, what Anton is saying, there's still no real agreed version of the truth for lessors and lessors trading with each other, etc., on aircraft documentation uh, during a transition or a trade. Um, financing of aircraft is going to get more expensive and more difficult to find. And the latest predictions are that you know we're at the top of the 10-year cycle, and we could see some contraction or, or some some stormy uh, weather ahead of us in the next you know two to three years. Mm -hmm. um, volatile economic conditions, as I mentioned there. Hmm. So what have IBM done in other industries in relation to distributed ledger technology? So there's two really large ones which are currently operating. One is IBM Food Trust, which has Nestle, Walmart, uh, Dole. It has some of the, probably every large food company in the world is now using IBM's Food Trust. So this, this was designed in order to capture uh, food recalls. So prior to IBM Food Trust and prior to a blockchain network uh, distributed ledger, companies found it very difficult to identify batches of food that needed to be, re you know, if there was a recall. So what would happen is if there was a recall, say, uh, as a result of an outbreak in Ennis, the whole of Munster uh, would, would suffer the recall. With IBM's food chain now, they're able to identi identify it right down to maybe, say, um, Tesco's in, in uh, Limerick or, you know, uh, a couple of shops in Cork or, you know, uh, Super Value in Newcastle West, wherever it might be, you know, so they can hone in using blockchain as to where the particular problem is. Another one which they've done recently, uh, and it started off with Maersk, is on the uh, shipping containers. So now TradeLens tracks every shipping container around the world um, on blockchain. So there isn't a, a shipping container that doesn't move now um, without it being captured uh, with an immutable trace across blockchain. Um, the very interesting thing about this one is, and I sat in on a meeting the other day, is they're now using um, the data that they've gathered to uh, tackle human trafficking. So they're able to use, they're able to see patterns of uh, unusual container uh, movements uh, out of different ports, particularly Rotterdam and uh, the North and some of the French ports. Uh, and they're able to now focus in on uh, patterns using algorithms on people trafficking, which I thought was really, really interesting. So I think one of the points I was going to make in relation to this is that when you gather the data, um, it's, it's then and only then that you see additional use cases presenting themselves. So from an aviation point of view, how can this technology help us? So um, there's shared pain points uh, across, say, the lessor, the OEM, and the operators. Um, and if we take it from a documentation point of view, 
from a process transparency point of view and an administrative point of view, you see that there's pain points across all, all of the three major actors that we deal with. And um, from a lessor point of view, complete documentation and visibility of the necessary docu documents during a trade uh, or a transition of an aircraft. Let me just take that one. I see Francis sitting on the bottom of the... So this time last year, as the CTO of Dubai Aerospace, the CEO walked into me and he said, um, I hope you don't mind, but DVB are offering a tranche of aircraft for sale. We'd like to get the sale done before the end of the year. Um, and I have to put 27 people within my technical team uh, to work uh, to do the due diligence that DVB, um, so DVB opened up a data room. They provided all the documentation for the tranche of aircraft. And we had to try and do that due diligence uh, before the end of the year. Pardon? Christmas week. Christmas week. <laughs> so you can imagine, you know, I was kind of asking myself at the time, I knew I knew as soon as the CEO walked in that this is going to be a large body of work and I'm going to have to put the whole team to work on this. That, that due diligence piece, right, separate out this particular deal, but in general what happens is the due diligence piece uh, ends up with a number of discrepancies which you mentioned earlier on. And that number is getting bigger and bigger. It used to be a couple of hundred. It's now running into the thousands, right? But fundamentally, what is that? That is, it manifests itself in a discount on the purchase price of the aircraft. That's what happens. Um, and it's probably not um, in line with the actual findings. Um, so you're, lo you're looking at anywhere between 250,000 to over a million, a million and a half of a discount in the purchase price of the aircraft, all because you can find that back to fair traceability on the downlock actuator of a landing gear that wasn't overhauled the last time, but was overhauled 20 years ago, <laughs> right? Um, and this is to the point that we're making with the non-instant statements. It's crazy stuff, and it's it's been leveraged against the purchase price of the aircraft. It doesn't really make sense, okay? Um, and you, you see there across the, the, the nine different uh, the nine different pain points, um, you know. So uh, with the airline the administrative inefficiencies occurring as a result of internal communication sign off, Anton mentioned that not, air, not all airlines are like EasyJet, um, and you're dealing with so many different airlines around the world that um, in some of the emerging nations, you know, that the processes that they may have established internally are not as slick as say. Um, Easy jet uh, in Luton. <laughs> so what, what do we what, what can we do? Or what can the technology do to kind of um, help us out here? Um, so in the blockchain world, they're calling a distributed ledger technology an ecosystem. So if you can imagine a what they call a digital fabric, okay. And what happens is you have participants on the ecosystem. And now the way it works is this is known as a private distributed ledger, okay? So the idea would be to reach out to all of the lessors and ask all of the lessors to participate in joining this private distributed network, okay? And let's say we have a lessor here, GCAS. So GCAS are sitting on the, sitting on the ecosystem. They have all of their digital documentation on um, uh, Airbolt, is it? Um, and it all resides on Airworld and it's fine, it's all there. What happens is they would be given a node on the ecosystem, right? Fully within your control, all the security systems, all the security that you have uh, uh, now would be replicated. In fact, it would probably be, be better. And if you were selling a tranche of aircraft, what would happen is you'd be able to open up um, that data room automatically on the ecosystem so that the buyer, the lessor who would be buying the aircraft, could see the documentation straight away. So no need to open up a data room. It gets better. Okay. And what we can have is what we call consensus protocols being built, which operate within the ecosystem. So the idea is that we will get all the lessors together. And I'm going to use a brand new aircraft delivery as an example. Okay. So the plan is to uh, use the uh, forum um, Aircraft Leasing Ireland, AI, to bring all of the major lessors who are here in Ireland and from other countries as well together 
to that's, let me give you a delivery documentation example. So what we would do is we would build a consensus protocol about what we all agree constitutes a delivery set of documents. So as Anton said, um, the crate, the digital crate that, that GCAS uses would be the delivery set of documents. And you build an algorithm around that, right? So what happens is the participants would just upload the documentation. The ecosystem would be able to um, pull it in using artificial intelligence and machine learning, which is part of what IBM called our Watson system. They'd be able to file all that documentation and establish whether or not it meets the consensus protocol in relation to what constitutes a, an agreed delivery set of documents. If that data comes in and it gets a thumbs up by the system, what happens is the system converts it into an algorithm, basically a mathematical formula. It sends it out to all the participants and the nodes on each of the participants on the network, the nodes try and solve that formula. Okay? They solve the mathematical equation. That's how it works. This is how Bitcoin works as well. The mathematical equation gets solved. The answer gets distributed back in. And as long as 51% of the participants agree, that documentation is then becomes a block in the blockchain. Right? So what you have now is you have every participant agreeing that the block in the blockchain is immutable, it's, uh, it's accepted, and everybody agrees that that delivery documentation is intact. Now, when DAE goes to sell or goes to buy a tranche of aircraft from DDB, that's already been done. So we have agreement across the, all the MSNs, 15, 20 MSNs, that the documentation is already agreed. So now when you go to trade, you just open up. You can still do a, a level of due diligence, but my hope would be that the system will be so robust that after a while you realize actually that the due diligence doesn't need to be done because the internal algorithms have already solved for the documentation. Okay. So what have we done um, with IBM? Again, you see, uh, you see the uh, value delivery here across financiers, OEMs, technical service providers, lessors. You have the legal piece here, which, which eventually could be GATS, and GATS are uh, looking at a blockchain solution. They're not putting it in place right now, but they're building it with, uh, with blockchain in mind to uh, access a, you know, a digital fabric at, at some stage, probably sooner rather than later. So what I did was, over the last couple of months, I said, right, we need to start. We need to start this. So we took delivery documentation. So we took an A320, the 2008 A320, um, and we took all the documentation and we put it onto the, uh, onto the, uh, sorry, go back, onto the uh, fabric. So um, here we have purchase of an aircraft, first delivery, uh, the file pre-work inspections, test work, QA findings and rework, technical acceptance, and then the commercial transfer, you know, in relation to the lessor buying the aircraft from. Airbus and uh, leasing it on to the airline. So at the moment, we just did uh, aircraft delivery. And aircraft are now what they call born digital. Okay. So, um, and as such, there's substantial potential for transforming the whole aircraft leasing uh, uh, process or cycle. Um, so we took that digital documentation that Airbus has provided uh, with the aircraft and Put it onto uh, blockchain, and here it is. So we have a working uh, example here, um, and this I blanked out the MSN, but there is an actual MSN 2008 A320. Uh, last Friday, we, we put the aircraft, it went live on IBM's Hyperledger. So this is the first commercial aircraft on blockchain, it's out there, it's in the ether. If you wanted to log on to this system and pull down all of the records, they'll all be there. But it's the it's the delivery documentation for that aircraft established as the first block in a chain that will extend on forever as part of the uh, back to bird traceability for that aircraft, on, effectively on the ether. So what they say about blockchain is today is 1993 in relation to where the internet was uh, at that time for blockchain. It's very early stages, but they think that blockchain will do for transactions what the internet did for communication. Okay. So it's very, very exciting. 
So from my point of view, having been in the industry as long as I have, this is the first time I see a kind of an overarching system that will allow all of the systems that you you mentioned, there was six of them, right? Um, to continue to operate um, and continue to uh, file and store all the documentation. Um, but they're all silos of, of information that can actually be used to enter the blockchain. Mm -hmm. So you'll see here we took um, constituents, assemblies, equipment of entry, uh, all the mods, all the conformity design standards, concessions, etc., and it's on blockchain. Now imagine you're in your situation where you're 10, 12 years down the road. Sorry, I don't know your name. Bruce. Chris, is it? No, Bruce Allison. Bruce. So you're looking at a constituent assembly in terms of where it originated. It may have been, it may have moved off. Uh, this particular H320 and, and gone on to several other H320s. Landing gear is a typical example. So now you have a, a digital um, immutable kind of uh, fabric where we can trace it back to the constituent assembly. So one of the things that I did was I took every C of A that I had in my possession. I think it ended up at it's about 27 of them. And we fed it into Watson, which is IBM's uh, AI machine learning piece. And um, I had always read about AI, machine learning, of course it was always something over here, I never really understood it. So what happens is it takes it um, and it asks numerous questions. It asks numerous questions in relation to what it is. Um, and what happens is the machine learning piece, uh, it learns that this document is a C of A. Right? So when we got up to a point where no more questions were coming through from Watson in relation to the C of A, we introduced then a number of C of Rs. And initially, Watson kind of went, oh, they're C of As. They look very like C of As. They have a lot of information in relation to what a C of A has. But we went back and we thought, it, actually, no, these are C of Rs. But what was interesting was, out of nowhere, a C of A came in from IBM system that we hadn't uploaded. So it had plucked a C of A out of the ether somewhere else in the in the IBM worldwide record, a C of A was entered. Watson recognized the C of A and put it into our file. That blew me away, right? So in terms of back to bird traceability, as long as it's in here, it's forever locked in the chain. So whatever happens in the future, even though this, this chain is a particular MSN, you should be able to go back in and find what you're looking for. So these are the centers of gravity uh, that uh, blockchain is actually built around. Um, so IBM uses best practice and revolutionary technology blockchain to digitize and accelerate the aircraft leasing process. So we have we have uh, kind of five kind of ones which which should resonate with all of us. Um, so it's it's predominantly used in asset management. Um, we have a digital identity piece. Um, we have a provenance piece, which is absolutely key for our back bird traceability um, issues that we're having. Um, and what we have, which isn't really there, it, you know, we, we have a very, very good foundation with the AWG, with IATA, with everything else, but we don't have a kind of a socio-economic coordination between lessors. Now, there's a little bit of an altruistic kind of element to this because it will require the lessors into the fact that we're going to establish a, a fabric, a digital fabric that we can all work off and work around, but main, still maintaining a level of security and digital identity for the documents that you hold in whatever system you hold in your company. Okay, But the beauty is, is that there'll now be something out there powered by IBM blockchain that will allow you to interact pretty seamlessly uh, with each other. So that case of DAE and DVB um, having to, to do the due diligence right up until Christmas week and into Christmas Eve, and I think some of them might be even more Christmas Day, um, that's gone. So what we're going to have is we're going to have all of that solved in advance in, in relation to the, uh, the uh, consensus protocols that we've built. And the beauty about this consensus protocol is we have APA uh, Spec 2500 as guidance material for what constitutes a correct set of documentation for a transition or for a trade. What we do is we just leverage that, capture it, and put it into algorithms that will allow the system to do the due diligence for us. Mm -hmm. The beauty about it as well is that from a lessor point of view, 
you'll be able to use it as an audit, an internal audit to see what you don't have. Okay, so you can you can put a, you can um, submit a, a block of documentation or a crate of documentation, and it can tell you that actually no, you're missing the C of A. You don't have the insurance certificate, and the uh, supplemental lease agreement is not there as well. Right, so. CTOs and technical departments will be able to see, but actually what's missing in relation to the documentation that they currently hold. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a, a high-level roadmap vision in relation to where we'd like to get to. So the proof of concept is complete. Um, I put some personal capital in to get this done with IBM, um, and we now have the first uh, commercial aircraft in terms of delivery documentation on blockchain. Um, so now if somebody comes to, uh, to view what we've done, we can actually show them the, the system. Um, and I would like to extend an invite to anybody who might be interested to come up to the Innovation Hub uh, near Blanchardstown, uh, uh, out there on West, West Dublin, and see, uh, see what IBM have there in terms of the innovation piece uh, and the capability that they have. Hmm. The next piece would be, as I mentioned, we're looking to move towards a pilot with Lessors um, and other industry participants, uh, whether that's airlines, OEMs, etc. cetera. Um, and we're trying to, um, sorry, we, we do have the attention of David Swan as the chair of the ALI. It's actually Action 28 as part of the government strategy that, um, to develop a distributed led ledger technology for the aviation industry. So the government have actually made it part of their um, their uh, finance uh, plan uh, out to 2024. So they actually want this to happen. Um, and the amount of jobs that will be created from this, I think is exponential. Um, so we need, to, we need to try and get this pilot with less sort of up and running. So if anybody's interested in, in participating, um, we would be more than happy to speak to you. We're probably thinking it's it's relatively small money for less or as we're thinking in the range of say 50k and um, to become a participant and to become a, an early adopter of the technology we need that um, and you would get a you would get a, a, a seat on the ecosystem and and be able to see it working here and and influence how the consensus protocols would be formulated as we go forward the scaling is incredible because once we get the ecosystem up and running, there isn't a, a blockchain ecosystem for aviation right now. Um, not that I know of for lessors. Um, so I think really excited about it. Um, but we can scale it out to OEMs, to all the participants, to tech reps, you name it. Anybody that's actually in, involved with the leasing on the side of the business. We can, we can scale it out and put various different nodes on the ecosystem to allow them to upload documentation or indeed to view documentation as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, who knows what new features and capabilities can, will derive from the, the gathering of the data. You know, it's, 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 uh, it's not until you get the data in and you can analyze the data that you can see that uh, what, the, what the other um, industry capabilities would be. Mm -hmm. So benefits, um, again, for a lessor, documentation, transparency of process, real-time visibility of where your records actually are, um, and more importantly, timely acceptance of aircraft. For the OEMs, um, documentation connected to technical acceptance is created and tracked. Uh, I was speaking to Conor McCarthy about this, and one of the areas which he's particularly interested in is the whole area of maintenance reserve reimbursements to the uh, to the overhaul facilities. We all know that you know the airlines are some of the airlines are actually being forced to pay twice, so they're they're paying the lessors maintenance reserve those that do nowadays, but um, they're also having to pay security deposits to uh, some of the large overhaul facilities uh, and then get reimbursed eventually from the lessor when all the documentation is uh, has been uh, completed and the due diligence process. The beauty here is that they would be able to upload the documentation onto the network. The consensus protocol will determine whether or not that documentation represents, say, a landing gear overhaul in its entirety. Um, and if it gets, if it gets a, a consensus in the blockchain, then the money can be paid directly to the, to the OEM. You know? 
so it should it should speed up that process as well and the the problem of having to send that documentation out to a landing gear expert to go through to see that we have all the documentation from the overhaul facility should disappear as well and um, let me pick another one um transparency of process decisions and sign offs by the airline so the likes of easy Jack could easily integrate with this um, and you know uh, have their current uh, digital system liaise with it to send in all the documentation that you might need eventually you could talk you could even think about utilization documentation actually coming through onto the system and you pick it up from the uh, the digital fabric rather than you know, uh, waiting for 15th of every month for the documentation to come in for utilization and then processing that internally. <laughs> um, and then, of course, it doesn't come in the format that you specified in your lease. It comes in in the GCAS format. More often than not, I know it's got GCAS formats. <laughs> so there's a lot for GCAS, to be honest. But, um, again, timely, the timely piece is actually key. So when I looked at it, GATS has identified the innovation piece as a, a piece that actually is, is contributing to the, the uh, big time element in relation to trading out of an aircraft. The reality of it is, is that's actually only a small piece. The bigger piece is the technical piece. It's that due diligence that is being done when you open up a data room for the documentation on your, on your aircraft. So, um, and that's taking anywhere currently from a month through the six months, and there has been cases where um, trading of aircraft has gone on uh, over a year. And for a CEO who's committing to his shareholders that he's going to offload a tranche of aircraft in 2020, uh, that's completely unacceptable. And it's also, it's, it's a little bit of a, a black mark against us as technical people because we do have all the documentation, we've worked really, really hard to digitize it, get it, capture it, and yet, it doesn't seem to be a way of reducing the time element that, 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 is, that is taken here. So, so there, there is a little bit of a vision attached to this. It took me having to step back from it a little bit to bring the vision to it. But um, IBM have done it and have done it successfully with Trade Lens and with Food Trust. And they're working currently with power distribution. And it's amazing, actually, some of the technology that, uh, that they're developing. Really small, quick story. Um, I was brought into the innovation lab the other day, and there was a bottle of hay whiskey and a glass, and a little bit of whiskey in the glass. And one of the young guys, millennials, took out his phone, put a little spectrometer uh, device, little camera on the uh, on the on the iPhone, and took a spectral analysis of the whiskey, and immediately was able to tell me that it originated in a little village between Edinburgh and Glasgow. Uh, it flowed through Glasgow, made its way to Belfast, and that particular batch came across the border, and hopefully with Brexit it still can, um, and uh, came across the border and was able to say that it was distributed out of a uh, uh, warehouse in Dublin. And all of that uh, from, you know, what they call an internet of things, IoT device. So right now there's about... Oh, and I know... Sorry, I know men who could do that without. So yeah, look, the technology's jumping forward. For me, you know, 47 year old guy, I get blown away by it, you know, every day. And I talk to So look, very early days, uh, as I said, we've, we've done the proof of concept. Um, that's it there, it's, it's sitting there now. You see, decides to left hand, right hand, passenger door, front left door end. So all the constituent assemblies are there, all the equipment is there, all the mod data. So if you want to take an aircraft and you want to uh, cargo conversion in uh, let's say year 12 or year 20, whatever it might be, You'll be able to go back and see what the uh, original um, delivery modification status was, what the compliance status was. All the provisions are in there, the provisioning that, was, that happened during the delivery of the aircraft. So you can go back and see that the wording is actually there or that set of extra set of seat tracks in the back of the room from 30 is there to allow you to go man or breast. You know, whatever you might, want, whatever you might need, it will all be there. Um, you have to start somewhere. I've started it. Uh, but we do need the participation to bring it forward. Yeah.
Thanks all. So that concludes the proceedings for today. Um, we want to open it up for discussion on distributed ledger technology or distributed record in general. Just three or questions all. Uh, yeah, just a quick question in terms of the No, so it, 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 it came in uh, simply in a PDF format, okay. but the, the Watson system had been taught or it, it had learned that it was a C of A okay. um, and then it searched the entire IBM kind of uh, network and said, where am I going to put this? And then realized that there was actually a file full of C of A's and it put it in there. Don't ask me to explain how it does that, but you know, um, I think what's 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 particularly exciting is that the technology is there to. We can teach uh, the Watson system, or indeed any artificial intelligence machine learning uh, um, system, to identify documentation. Um, and it, of course, there's probably a period of time now where we have to, as an industry, go ahead and do that. There's probably a lot of heavy lifting involved in relation to doing it, but we probably only have to do it once. Um, and then some of the some of these problems are actually going to get solved, you know. So the technology is there to do it, you know. <laughs> I'm just thinking on the example you, you've given, how how does the, the system know that that C of A? I mean, if I did up a, a C of A, a copy of a C of A and, and put it on a PDF and put it in there, would it know if it was a genuine document or not? I'm just curious how it uh, it it's it, uh it, it probably won't know whether it's a genuine documentation at this stage, but what you can do is a lot of C of A's have either a signature yeah, yeah. or a stamp. Yes. So you could you could teach the system to recognize the stamp no. of the particular yeah. national authority or indeed the signature. So a lot of the a lot of the um, delivery documentation that we did for this MSN was a guy called Michel Garnier. He was the uh, compliance, uh, compliance officer for Airbus for many, many years. So a lot of actually this documentation was actually signed by Michelle Grandi. And it, it knows that and it uses that as another, I suppose, an, another uh, indicator as to the uh, the authenticity of the document. You know? mm -hmm. oh, if you forgive a type one DNA question, um, how would it take to actually put that aircraft up on the system? And was it a question of scanning and, and automatic optical you know, character uh, recognition? Pulling the information, or did you have to transfer the information into the system? So it's a great question, and, and don't worry about being type 1 DNA because I think I was type minus 1 when I started. You know? <laughs> and so basically, what we did was we took the delivery documentation as it as it is presented by uh, Aeros. Now it's paper? Uh, digital. Digital. Okay. digital, meaning scanned documents, or? So the, yeah, the interesting thing a combination of both. But a lot of these, a lot of these inventories and modifications are all captured in, in, in um, XML format, I think it's what it's called. So when you get that documentation, we all we all see these nice files which we open up to see the lists. But interestingly, what's happening is the OEM provides that in a digital format as well. Which when IBM, when the boffins in IBM saw it, went, ah, oh, okay, we can use this. Now I've always seen that file on that delivery documentation, but never had any way to use it. I was always looking at the actual physical documents, the scan documents, but they can use, they can take the digitization of that and it went straight in and got done quite quickly. The piece that, the hard piece was explaining to YBM, you know, the links between the constituent assemblies, to actually explain what constituent assemblies are, what the equipment inventory is, what the AIR is and how that links back to the ATA chapters to the various different so all of this got linked where it was where it needed to be linked as we understand it in the industry. So this is the thing about the technology. It needs industry participation in order to build out the use case correctly. Okay. They have the technology, it's just on how how the industry works. Okay. So they have all of these guys all around the world. So the team was uh Three Indians, uh, lady in Moscow, uh, lady in uh, South Carolina, 
and the team loving it and um, brought together. But all in all, this took about three weeks. What age was it? Sorry, was it 2008? 2008. 2008. Yeah, okay. So it has, as components were changed, it now has that full trust. No, what we did was we took the delivery documentation and put it on blockchain. Right. Okay. So the next stage now is to take um, is to take a period of one year and take the documentation that we have in the documentation pack at year one and put that in as the next uh, as the next juncture. Mm -hmm. One thing I, I need to mention as well is that there's a, um, the international registry is here in Ireland as well in terms of when you want to register the, the uh, mortgage interest in the aircraft. So that's run by Rob Callum and his team in, actually in Blanchardstown as well, which is quite good. So we got Rob over to have a look at this um, and he got very excited because he is thinking that there is a possibility to build out some of the capability that they currently have in forming an international aircraft documents registry, <laughs> right? So the idea would be as if this was a brand new aircraft, Paul, on when you go to uh, register your aircraft as a new aircraft with the international registry under the Cape Town Convention, they're a non-for-profit organization. Um, but Rob and his team have a, a very, very secure system that allows that registry to operate. It's not on blockchain, but they, they, they are thinking about migrating to blockchain. But one of the one of the uh, the add-on functionalities that he could see straight away was um, send us the delivery documentation alongside the um, registry documentation for the mortgage interest in the aircraft, and we. We'll take the delivery documentation in as part of the international document registry. Okay, the idea being that you're providing another level of, um, you know, the banks or the financiers are risk averse, so you find another level of comfort that the documentation section being captured. And then on the anniversary of the of the uh, mortgage interest requirement would renew. You would ask for the next tranche of documentation, the next tranche of doc documentation, build it up on blockchain and have it there on the digital fabric. Uh, which is immutable because it's all been agreed by the participants in the private distributed ledger ecosystem. So this is, uh, I think this is the overarching piece of technology you may have been looking for. And um, it's, it's up to the industry to decide really. You know. I wonder, quick question for you. How, how do you see this like interacting? If you take a factory example of, um, let's say, uh, Virgin Atlantic using Flydocs, being willing to participate as an airline with, with this concept. How do you see that all working? I, I, one thing I would say is that maybe for new aircraft going forward, from a lesser point of view, it makes sense. Trying to plug in the old stuff probably not so much because it would be probably just too costly for what you get back. Yeah. But I think um, if it can plug into, like you say, the fly docks of the world and, and, and become kind of almost automatically full of data, yeah, most well, certainly makes sense. It's a, it's a smart piece of thinking. Yeah. So you go back to pre-LOI or MOU stage with, uh, let's say, Virgin Atlantic. And let's say DVB identifies a tranche of 15, 20 aircraft that you want to buy from them. And in your pre-due diligence, before you even get to an LOI, what you could say is, can you um, provide all the technical documentation, uh, submit it to the to the um, distributed ledger and get an indication very early on as to whether <coughs> that documentation um, constitutes what the lessors have agreed under a consensus protocol as the proper set of documentation. So now you're entering into a deal, unlike the situation we had last year, where we didn't know whether we could get to Christmas Day and execute on a deal that needed to be done by the end of Q4 2018. Um, now, before you know, DE or DBB would enter into that particular uh, deal, we'd be able to see, well, actually, DBB have all of the documentation that's required under a consensus protocol for lessors. So it gets rid of some of the noise that's attached to the due diligence piece. And you're able to see very early on that this deal can actually take place. Now, the interesting thing is that you can always build in caveats to the purchase agreement to go back if required, right? So more often than not, what's happening is, is that the due diligence is, is, is hypothetical, right? So what happens is the due diligence is saying, I know there's no problem with this documentation today, 
right? But I have to think of an end of lease scenario where we're selling the aircraft out, you know, right? So I know the landing gear is fine today. It has a CRS from the last overhaul. But when I want to part out that landing gear in eight, six, eight, ten, twelve years time, I don't have that back to back home one for the up block actuator that I mentioned earlier on, right? So what you could do is you could say, uh, holistically, I have everything I need on the landing gear. And then rather than a financial discount for hypothetical reasons, what you do is build caveats into the purchase agreement that when you reach that point, if there is a problem, you have a, a spring back to the you know, the seller of the aircraft. <laughs> so the idea is to reduce that trading, uh, to reduce the time it takes to trade. Now, if there were CEOs of leasing companies in the room today, that would be music to their ears because it's taken far too long to trade aircraft. Mm -hmm. So I guess the other point is you, you could have a, a lesser number of checks when you're trading an aircraft. You don't need to do a full transition verification, right? Because that's where people are getting bogged down. They're, they're actually going from a small subset to too many documents asking each other. Everyone is guilty. You know? And um, <clears throat> so to, to narrow down that to maybe very high level pieces of material, I think is hard. Yeah, but everyone plays the same rules. And I guess that if you can get a concept like this going, that would drive the sale purchase agreement wording more than the other, you know, that because when people are let run loose, that they're looking for too many documents, even though the SPA is actually saying two documents, but they want everything, you know, to, to get this comfort zone. So that this is a it's a smart piece of work, mm -hmm. I think, for sure. I can't say we buy in at the moment because we're in the middle of not knowing what we're doing ourselves, but most certainly would be uh, pushed out with that idea. Yeah, as my thinking is, you know, I think critical mass here is maybe four to six less hours participation where we begin to write the rules for ourselves. Um, we're in a very, very highly regulated industry. So the, 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 the building blocks for this are already there. You know, 88 spec, 2500. Fantastic network. GCAS have done on the digital freight. It all lends itself really, really well. You know, the non uh, the, sorry, the clearance type of quality. <laughs> um, that, you know, all, all of that will lend itself to very quick establishment of the consensus protocols, you know. Um, and as long as you describe it correctly, um, so, you know, Anton mentioned, you know, verbs and nouns and adjectives, you know, um, that's actually what you need to do. You need to describe it to a tech joint like IBM and allow them to capture it. And, they, and basically they just capture it mathematically in an algorithm. And when the information comes in using machine learning and AI, it gives you a thumbs up or a thumbs down, you know? And if it gets a thumbs up, it gets automatically included into a chain for that particular MSN. It's forever there, it becomes immutable, it gets locked in and it's it's traceable forever. You can go, you can, trace back as time goes on back to that particular block of documentation. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm just thinking in terms of the kind of a cost benefit analysis, you, you spoke about the, the food industry, and obviously that has so many players in the industry, and therefore I'm sure I'm assuming that the cost to each of those small players on, on, on the node is relatively small. But in the leasing industry, you've only got, you know, let's say 50 players 54 in, last month 54 yeah. right so how, how do you how do you price this to make that attractive for them so that they, the actual that they'll see the benefit of, of the system without having to pay a huge amount of money for it all right well in, in 2000 um, january 2018 at the air finance conference kpmg let me flip for a second <laughs> um, Um, KPMG did a survey, and um, I'll pull it up here now in a second, but they did a survey with all the uh, lesser CEOs and CFOs, and the overriding um, problem that came back was the time it's taking to trade aircraft. And at the moment, a lot of lessors are putting their faith in GATS, so a lot of lessors are saying actually GATS is going to solve all of this, all of this trading. 
personally, I don't, I don't think it will. It will solve the novation piece, but I think in certain, in certain circumstances where there's a trust structure that lends itself to putting the aircraft into an overriding trust. Okay, I'm still conscious of your question, but um, and that's predominantly the end registered aircraft. You know, I don't know if every SPV structure, and um, particularly in relation to aircraft here in Ireland, would lend itself well to, you know, that trust piece. But what, what I did was I took a look at it, and the bigger piece of that uh, of that time is actually the technical due diligence. Okay, so when you reach back in, if you talk to any of the CEOs. For any, sorry, for any CTO, the nightmare in the leasing company is when the CEO comes in the door and says he wants to sell a tranche of aircraft that you hadn't anticipated, right? That it, it's it's a deal that's been done in January or, you know, at the Air Finance Conference, and all of a sudden there's a tranche of aircraft. Now, generally what happens is there's they're, they're packaged. So a couple of really nice aircraft, maybe a couple of 787s or a couple of A350s. There's kind of middle-of-the-road aircraft, and then there's a... There's a couple of uh, couple of dogs or donkeys or whatever you might want to call it at, at the other end, you know. And um, so the new the new shiny stuff is relatively simple, you know. But when you're getting into a 15 year old ATR 72 and you know that's been operating in Indonesia or something like that, that's a different story, right? So it's that time piece that you're going to reduce, right? If from a cost benefit analysis, if you can reduce that even by a day, uh, we reckon it's 750 US dollars, one day. And these projects are going two, three, four, five, six months, and in some cases longer. Um, so anything that we can do to reduce the time it takes to trade aircraft and solve that technical piece, um, I think it's a no-brainer for the lessors to buy into. <laughs> maybe a twist on that one. So if you take the likes of Jet Airways that we were involved in the Shuttle 7s, which were only financed, there was a lot of lessors involved with the, with the minor body fleet. So the big risk that the financial takes, they've actually had no records when they hit a bankruptcy with an airline like that because they hadn't anticipated from day one. And, and it you know, causes a huge issue. So rather than having a limit of 54 lessors, you can actually have pretty much every aircraft in the world that you can once they sell it to the financial team, but you can show them the benefit of, of, uh, of participating as well. So I think it broadens the, the well, certainly the catchment to the benefit there. I, I agree. Um, let me just put this up here. So one of the things that I've been it has has advised is that there's an independent aggregator for all of this and um, so on the trade lens piece that they did on the on the um, containers initially they did the piece of work with Maersk but the problem was all of the other container companies were reluctant to get involved uh, predominantly because they saw it as a Maersk product a competitor so IBM have learned that there needs to be an independent aggregator in order to drive it and you know, it's very early stages, but this is out chain. This is me, and um, so what I did was I took some um, some fabric. You probably recognise it as, as uh, fiberglass fabric that we use on an aircraft, and um, to represent the digital fabric and a uh, Celtic knot to to uh, to to uh, demonstrate the continuity piece and the immutability piece. In fact, you know, it's all. It's all everlasting and, and into eternal, you know. So this is this is our chain. But to come back to the KPM, uh, KPMG piece, um, so this is Peter Barrett from SNBC. I presented to SNBC the other day. That's the um, the slides. But um, Peter said that it would uh, Peter Barrett would make. Would make life easier for that source to move assets which have several owners or operators over their 25 years used to life. He actually said the owner and the operator may change several times, and each of those transitions is very complex, very time consuming, and expensive. Finding a better way to do that would be really important for the business because it will attract even more capital into the industry as assets will become more liquid and pricing will become more competitive. It's a good point. We're, we're, with this, we'd be making the assets uh, more liquid, you know. 
uh, and a more liquid um, environment is going to attract more capital in with industry where in the next two to three years we see shrinkage in relation to that you know so in terms of there being some uh, some storm clouds approaching this could lend itself well to further investment into our industry in making these these assets more uh, you know making them more uh, commodities rather than, than uh, big ticket pieces you know? um, and then KPMG in, in the same in the same uh, survey, they said that fifty five percent of respondents to the survey believe deals fails for uh, avoidable reasons, including unexpected due diligence issues. Um, and we've all been there, right? And um, I'd say a heads on. <laughs> um, so unavoidable uh, unavoidable due diligence uh, issues is what we're trying to get to. Um, I think that was me on Christmas Eve last year. Thank <laughs> like you, Brad Pitt. <laughs> um, this is ALI. So um, we had a roundtable, technology roundtable, on the seventh of October. David Swan is leading it. Uh, that's Dr. Paul Wine from the Department of Finance. So we put some heavy hitters in in relation to. Um, there should be a, a blockchain for aircraft. Leasing. Um, so it's Action 28 in Ireland for Finance documents published by the Department of Finance. So I think um, if anybody is interested in taking part in joining a working group, um, I, I plan to lead it uh, and use the IBM facility and their, their huge campus in Manchester to host it and for all the various different um, technologies that they have to lean in and, and Establish these consensus protocols once and for all, you know, so that we can move forward in a different vein. <clears throat> That's it for me. Good question from my side, Owen. You mentioned about creating jobs. How do you see it creating jobs? Well, interestingly, um, Anton is saying that he'd like to burn the paper. Um, I'd have a slightly different view in that I think the paper needs to reside alongside the technology. Um, because even though you have a, a digital representation of it, I think um, there may be cases, particularly legal cases and all that, that force you back into actually pulling the dirty fingerprint or the, the signed document. So I see, and Dr. Paul Ryan in the Department of Finance is quite interested in this. Uh, we have a beautiful library in Trinity College, um, and during the Dark Ages, scribes out on the west coast, of the northwest coast, and islands kept. You know, uh, documentation alive in the, in the form of uh, the Bible. But there's a history here in Ireland of keeping documentation alive. Mm -hmm. um, we have some of the finest libraries around in, in, in the world. So, one of the things we'll be looking at is maybe a global aircraft documentation repository. Don is producing 20 to 25 technical record experts uh, every time that course graduates. I, I love seeing it, by the way, it's, it's, it's a fabulous initiative. But you know, there's a lot of people out there already trained in aircraft documentation. Uh, IBM are going to have to, you know, bring people in to process all of this documentation as well and put it up there. It does require a human interface in terms of knowledge piece, in terms of knowing what they're looking at. So I think there's there's huge scope to, you know, have a couple of hundred jobs, maybe five hundred jobs in the space of them, and. and Rather than uh, a suite of documentation sitting in a hangar in Mumbai or Delhi, um, or wherever it might be, uh, you know, there are places <coughs> around the world where the environmental conditions don't lend themselves well to the actual storage of paper. You could send that documentation into Ireland, and then Ireland becomes the world hub for not only aircraft leasing, but for the uh, repository of paper documentation, alongside, you know, uh, a, a digital fabric that would allow. Training and transitions to happen easier. And time wants to manage that, I think. But those 500 jobs at uh, Shannon Group were building absolutely the outside yeah, there. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I've always been an advocate for Shannon, as you know. Um, yeah. So I've done far too much time, but uh, if there's any other questions, happy to take them. Um, you know, uh, what about the airline take on access to the moment? Airline take? Yeah. Um, Has it been tested on the road? 
So you saw the ALI. So the only person I've spoken to right now is Fergus uh, Wilson, um, who's the CTO at Aer Lingus. Um, now he's very interested. He has a number of transitions in the pipeline uh, coming out. I'm probably dealing with some of you guys at the moment. Um, so he'd love to try that. He'd love to be able to say to the accepting us or all of our documentation is on the ecosystem. Knock yourself out. Because they've been trying to do that with Drylands or with Stream or with whatever. And that is, that is never going to work. Because it, it, it just doesn't lend itself to the concept. Whereas this actually is a, a, a neutral test. Yeah. Uh, no one can disagree with it. If the computer says yes, no problem. Yeah. And move on. And that, that's the um, that's the, the the other piece which is key in the in the whole Bitcoin piece. It's that the human trust has now been removed. So what it is, it's a, it's a, it's an algorithm that establishes the trust between two parties to allow the transactions to take place. So similarly, it'll be uh, an ecosystem <coughs> that allows the verification of the documentation in order to allow a transition or a, tra or a trade to take place. Mark. Yeah, I think the airline is the one that's going to save more money. Okay, if it's going to facilitate us, it's going to make our lives easier, there's no question. But the airline is the big game here. I mean, you know, we're sitting with TH5 at the moment, probably three months late on average with deliveries, and that's three months rental plus, plus, plus. Mm -hmm. you know, so they could save a huge amount of money. And the resources. And the resource and time and space in the hangar, all that goes with it. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a huge. But what was, you know, Napoleon said about Istanbul that if the world was a state, Istanbul, Istanbul should be its capital. Um, but for a place that, that facilitated so much trade between the East and West, you know, it always amazes me how difficult it is to deal with THY. You know? <laughs> 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 but, <laughs> Sorry, this is being broadcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll talk to you for listening, that's only a joke. <laughs> right, guys, I think uh, we leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you all of this.